Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our CME session, Suicide Intervention and Prevention in the Primary Care Setting. My name is Laura Young and my colleagues at uh, UTMB and our team here in Tyler are excited to have you join us for this session. Uh, we have uh, two presenters today. Uh, Dr. Shotwell, I'm going to go ahead and pull your bios over here, Dr. Jos uh, Joseph Shotwell and Carolyn Wen. So Dr. Shotwell is a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's currently the assistant professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UTMB in Galveston. His primary role in Galveston is serving as the medical director for the UTMB Texas Child Health Access through Telemedicine. Yes, that is a mouthful. That is our T-Chat program, uh, our program that works with counseling in the schools, short-term counseling. If you are not familiar with that, please reach out to your local uh, uh, hub, your T-Chat hub, and they will tell you more about that. Um, with him today is Carolyn Wen. Carolyn is a third year medical student at UTMB uh, in Galveston. She received her uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology with a minor in Biochemistry at the University of Texas at Arlington. She's passionate about improving patients' quality of life through psychiatry, specifically depression and suicidality. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Dr. Shotwell, and to Caroline, and um, we're all excited to hear uh, your session today. All right, thank you very much. Give me just a minute now. I'll try to share my screen and make sure you're seeing the correct screen. I see mountains. Good, that's a good start. And now I see the session. Wonderful. I'll turn it over to you. OK, full disclosure, my computer generally does not like Microsoft Teams, but fingers crossed everything goes OK with it. All right. OK, so thank you everyone for joining me today. Today we're going to be discussing suicide prevention uh, in the primary care setting. OK, in the spirit of transparency, I just want to make sure everyone's aware that neither Caroline or myself have any disclosures that we need to make prior to this presentation. So we have a lot on the agenda for today. So first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be reviewing the most recent suicide data and statistics that are published by the <clears throat> Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And then I'm going to pass the presentation over to Ms. Caroline and she's going to discuss some of the risk and protective factors for suicide. And she's also going to discuss potential warning signs that an individual might be considering suicide. After that, we're gonna take a look at some of the youth suicide screening recommendations from various national organizations. And then we're also gonna explore some of the evidence-based suicide screening instruments that are available for clinicians to use in particular, I want everyone on the call today to feel comfortable leaving the call, knowing how to use the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale to assess for youth suicide risk. I also want everyone to leave the talk today feeling comfortable in their ability to develop a safety plan for their patients. So why should we talk about suicide? Well, it's one of the leading causes of death for individuals in the United States. On average, close to 50,000 individuals die by suicide every year. Millions more contemplate suicide, and as many as 1.7 million individuals attempt suicide every year. Just in the amount of time we discuss suicide today, as many as five individuals might take their own life. Because as you can see, there's one death by suicide generally every 11 minutes. So we're going to start by taking a look at some of the data, uh, the most recent data published on the Center for Disease Control website. Um, so this is a look at the general pattern for suicide rates over the last two decades. And as you can see, for the most part, there's been a steady increase in the suicide rates. You can see a slight dip. Uh, in the 2000, 
2018 to 2020 range, but then it quickly rebounds and it's been increasing since then. So looking at the most recent data that they have available, which is really 2021, 2022 data, you can see they even consider 2022 data to still be provisional. The overall number of deaths by suicide is still increasing. So in that time period, period from 2021 to 2022, it went up another 2.6%. So taking a look at this chart, the gray bar graphs represent 2021 and the purple graphs, uh, bar graphs represent 2022 suicide data. On the right hand side, you can see the percent change in each of those categories that are listed. Uh, the only population to see a decline in suicides recently um, were those that identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, and then also individuals in that 10 to 24 range. All other populations in that time period pretty much saw an increase in the total number of suicides. So we're going to look at all of that in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. First, we're going to look a little bit closer at race and ethnicity. Uh, we can see that American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest age adjusted suicide rates per 100,000 individuals. This is followed by non Hispanic whites, Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, those that identified as multiracial, non Hispanic blacks, Hispanic individuals, and then the lowest suicide rate is amongst non Hispanic Asian individuals. I do want to point out, though, that being in a minority group is increasingly becoming a risk factor for suicide and not just minority in respect to race, race or ethnicity, but also minority in regards to sexual orientation. So individuals that identify as non heterosexual are much higher risk for suicide than their heterosexual peers. The suicide rate amongst that population might be as much as five times higher. Um, I also want to point out in recent years, there has been a slight decrease in suicide rates for non Hispanic white population, um, but there's been a significant increase amongst minority groups, particularly those that identified as non Hispanic Alaska Native or American Indian, or those that identified as non Hispanic Black. So there is an increase in those minority groups uh, in their suicide rates recently. Uh, what about gender? What, what role does gender play in suicide risk? So being a male puts you at much higher risk of death by suicide. Uh, males are approximately 50% of the population, but they account for as much as 80% of the suicides annually. Um, so about four times the risk for females uh, when it's been age adjusted. As I mentioned, uh, there are other risk factors that play into suicide risk. Another one is age. So um, this graph shows the crude suicide rates per 100,000 individuals. The <clears throat> age range with the highest suicide rates are really individuals who are 85 plus. Uh, the range with the lowest suicide rates are those who are ages 10 to 14. So the younger ones have a lowest, lower suicide rate the highest is amongst the elderly 85 plus. Um, I do want to point out though that lowest rate is for those who are 10 to 14, but look, once you become in that 15 to 24 range, your suicide risk is almost as high as it is for most of adulthood. So there's a pretty abrupt transition that takes place there during late adolescence, early adulthood. So looking at age as a risk factor for suicide a little more closely, you can see that being over age 75 and being a male puts you in the highest risk category for suicide. Um, remember from the last slide that the 10 to 24 uh, group, which would be those that were 10 to 14 or 15 to 24, that was really the group that had the lowest suicide rates per 100,000 people. But I want to point out that suicide is the second leading cause of death in this age group. So these are individuals who otherwise would be unlikely to die if not by suicide. Uh, this group has also seen one of the largest increases in suicide rates over the past two decades. Uh, 
A recent survey that they did of high school students, uh, they found out that as many as 9% of those students reported making a suicide attempt in the past 12 months alone. So that's a pretty staggering number. 10% of our student population attempting suicide, not just considering it. Suicide rates also vary based on location. So suicide rates tend to increase as an area becomes more rural. If you remember from an earlier slide, the ethnic groups with the higher suicide rates are non-Hispanic American Indians or Alaska Natives, as well as non-Hispanic whites. Both of those are populations that might be more likely to live in a rural setting versus an ur urban setting. And this is a map that shows the suicide rates for each individual state across the United States. And you can see that the highest rates of suicide are really in the Inner Mountain West, which is a very rural area relative to your other areas. Coastal areas are where most of the population tends to be. So suicide rates highest in Alaska and then also the Inner Mountain West. So there is a graph on the CDC website that shows you the leading causes of death in the United States for individuals age 1 to 44. And it goes from the 1980s all the way up into the 2000s. You can click on the graph and watch it change over time, year by year, seeing where suicide falls and how the suicide rate has been climbing um, as, a, as a cause of death over the last couple of decades. Uh, I don't want to try to switch over to that animated graph. I'm afraid if I do that, I'll have difficulty getting back to the presentation and getting back on track. But I wanted you to know that it existed. It's really amazing to watch how the leading causes of death have changed over time. And as I mentioned, suicide is really creeping up and is now the second leading cause of death in that age group, the 1 to 44 age group. And it's second only to accidents as the leading cause of death. Something else I wanted to point out that kind of surprised me a little bit is deaths by suicide exceeded deaths by COVID in the 1 to 44 age group, even at the peak of the pandemic. So that really helps to kind of put it into perspective for you. So up until this point, we primarily discuss risk factors for suicide that a person has very little control over age, ethnicity, race, gender, location. So now we're going to transition over and talk about risk factors that can be modified. And one of the biggest risk factors for suicide is access to lethal means, such as a firearm. So when we look at how people die by suicide, firearms account for more than half of the deaths by suicide, followed by suffocation and then poisoning, something like overdose. So I'm now going to pass the presentation over to Caroline, who's going to discuss some of the various risk and protective factors that you might consider when you're evaluating someone's suicide risk. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline. I'm a third year medical student at UTMB, and I'm super grateful to be here talking to you all alongside Dr. Shotwell. So um, risk factors for suicide can be conceptualized at the individual, community, and societal levels um, for individual factors, previous suicide attempts, or self-harming behaviors um, accounts for a really significant one. Notably, there's a higher risk associated with higher number of attempts, history of depression, and other mental illness, particularly mood disorders, um, including bipolar disorder. Um, serious illnesses such as chronic pain, an example coming to mind is like fibromyalgia, but it can be any other debilitating disorder that significantly affects quality of life. Um, criminal and legal problems such as murder that could potentially end up being a murder-suicide situation, um, jobs or financial problems or loss, um, this obviously negatively impacts an an individual's ability to meet their basic needs and therefore also negatively affects their quality of life. Um, impulsivity or aggressive tendencies, one such example can be untreated ADHD as far as the impulsivity, um, substance use, particularly those that um, lower inhibition such as alcohol use, um, current or prior history of adverse childhood events or traumatic experiences, especially involving violence, 
Um, an individual might see suicide as a way to escape this abuse or the pain itself associated with the aftermath of the abuse. Um, a sense of hopelessness, I think this speaks for itself. Um, an individual might simply believe that life isn't worth living anymore due to any number of reasons, um, and then violence, victimization, and or perpetration. Next slide, please. So community risk factors um, that can contribute to suicide risk, a lack of access to health care where community members can't receive treatment for their underlying mental health problems, um, perhaps due to a lack of providers nearby. Um, there can be barriers also to getting patients admitted to inpatient psychiatric units when indicated. So these patients can often present to the ED for suicidal ideation instead and ultimately get discharged home without any mental health intervention. Um, suicide clusters. One example um, is the increase in suicide rates after the show, Three Reasons Why. I'm sure most of y'all have heard about it. Um, and then there's also an occasional situation where um, youth have a suicide pact together. Um, stress of acculturation, cultural, a um, particularly if they don't have adequate support system in place to support this transition, um, language barriers and finances associated with these struggles can also limit an individual's ability to access mental health services. Um, community violence, which can include being in a war zone where suicide may seem like the better option opposed to being captured by the enemy or tortured or murdered in any other way. Um, historical trauma and discrimination, this can include systemic racism and this obviously also decreases quality of life for those who experience it and even generations to come. Next slide, please. Uh, societal risk factors, so stigma associated with health seeking and mental illness make certain populations less likely to seek out mental health services and more averse to considering appropriate pharmacotherapy, even when indicated. Um, in our region, we can see this with our Hispanic populations, as well as um, folks presenting from rural communities. And in my own experience, I've definitely seen this with the Asian community as well. And then another group that's uh, highly affected due to stigma is physicians. Um, easy access to lethal means of suicide among people at risk. This is the reason why, as Dr. Shotwell mentioned earlier, psychiatrists are always asking about the presence of firearms in the home. Um, more than half of all suicides take place using firearms. And then another accessible lethal mean could be perhaps unsecured medications from a fellow member in the household that someone with suicidal ideation could get a hold of. Um, unsafe media portrayals of suicide. There's a lot of movies and shows out there that have suicide as part of the main storyline, like 13 Reasons Why that I mentioned before. Uh, media portrayals can also include social, social media. Um, and I, I hear people around my age and maybe younger normalizing suicide on social or in real life by saying, like, you're my 13th reason, as in you make me want to kill myself. Um, another reference to that show, but just a way that people normalize suicide in our general society. Next slide. So uh, factors against suicide can be conceptualized at an individual relationship, community, and societal levels. Um, individual uh, risk uh, protective factors can include effective coping and problem solving skills, reason for living like friends, family, dogs, cats, et cetera, and a strong sense of cultural identity. Um, I think the slide is pretty self explanatory. Basically, it helps if you feel like you're valued by others and you belong. Um, people might hesitate to consider suicide if they have some reason for living, and no reason is ever too small as long as it protects the individual. Next slide. Uh, relationship protective factors, um, that can include support from partners, friends, family, just generally feeling connected to others. Um, again, I think this is uh, pretty self-explanatory as well, but just kind of tagging on to that sense of connectedness, a strong therapeutic relationship specifically with a provider, be it their primary care or a mental health professional, might be something that protects an individual when they seek care for suicidal ideation. Again, it's it's about 
done perceiving that sense of value and connectedness. Next, please. Um, community protective factors that can include feeling connected the school, community, and other societal institutions, and availability of consistent and high quality physical and behavioral health care. Um, as we discussed earlier, a really big uh, community risk factor for suicide is the lack of access to mental health care. But conversely, we can't emphasize enough the protective value of having mental health treatment available. In particular, it's important for those with underlying mental health conditions or substance use disorders to be able to get the treatment they need to reduce their overall risk of suicide. And um, as stated on the slide, this isn't limited to mental health care. Um, Dr. Shotwell mentioned earlier that being over 85 years old puts you at highest risk for um, suicide, which often correlates to poor physical health status. And so, by addressing physical health needs, you're also helping to reduce the risk of suicide. Next, please. Um, so societal protective factors, um, reduce access to lethal means of suicide among people at risk, cultural, religious, or moral objections. I think these also speak for themselves. Next slide, please. So suicide warning signs. If you see that someone is at risk for suicide, there are certain warning signs you could watch out for that include, but are not limited to, talking about being a burden, being isolated, increased anxiety, talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain, increased substance use, looking for a way to access lethal means. And the list continues on the next slide. Increased anger or rage, extreme mood swings, expressing hopelessness, sleeping too much or too little. Oh, I read that backwards, but still. Um, talking or posting about wanting to die or making plans for suicide. And as I mentioned earlier, please note that this is not a comprehensive list of all possible warning signs. And also certainly people that have some of these warning signs like maybe poor sleep or irritability might not all be suicidal since, you know, life just happens. So it's important for providers to recognize the context of these symptoms and if it represents a change from the patient's baseline. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Caroline. So up until this point, uh, we've reviewed the statistics on suicide. Uh, we've taken a look at the risk and protective factors for suicide. We've talked about what some of the warning signs are for suicide. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about ways to prevent suicide. So the first step in preventing suicide is really to identify those who are at risk. So first question is really, who should we screen? So really who we screen depends on who you ask. So if you ask the United States Preventative Services Task Force who they recommend screening for suicide, they aren't really sure if we should screen you. So they cite insufficient evidence for us to screen for suicide in children and adolescents. Instead, they focus their recommendations on screening all adolescents from age 12 to 18 for depression. What about the American Academy of Pediatrics? What do they say? Well, they recommend universal screening for suicide for all youth ages 12 plus. Uh, for individuals that are age 8 to 11, they recommend screening when clinically indicated. For example, if an individual came in that was in that age range 8 to 11 and they had a history of depression or a history of self-harming behaviors, that might be someone that you want to screen at every visit for suicidal ideation. Uh, for those that are less than age eight, screening is not routinely indicated per the American Academy of Pediatrics. What about the Joint Commission, the organization that often provides us guidelines on how we practice medicine uh, in the academic settings? So they recommend screening all individuals 12 and up who are being evaluated or treated for a behavioral health concern. And they recommend doing that screening using a validated suicide screening tool. So the type of screening tool recommended really depends on the setting where the health services are being provided, whether it's inpatient, whether it's outpatient, 
um, or so on. And I do want to point your attention to the last statement on there. Um, healthcare organizations should take action to ensure that all clinical staff who conduct suicide screenings are trained and competent to do so. So they don't want you just doing suicide assessments on everyone. They want you to know how to do it and what to do with the information that you obtain. So two of the three organizations we looked at recommend we screen those 12 and up for suicide risk. Um, how do we screen individuals who are at risk? So that's question number two, how do we screen? Uh, I first want to point out there's no gold standard screening tool for assessing suicide risk in youth. Which screening tool you use really depends on the clinical setting where you're working and the competency of the person who's administering the screening. So you want to make sure it's something that the person feels comfortable using and they know how to use it. So we're going to go through a couple of examples together. We're going to talk about the patient health questionnaire nine or PHQ nine, the ask suicide screening questions or ASQ. And then we're also going to talk about the Columbia suicide severity rating scale or the CSSRS. So most of us on the call are probably familiar with the PHQ-9 at this point. This is a commonly used screening instrument for depression for individuals 12 and up. Uh, I do want to point your attention to the final question on the PHQ-9. So this is really the question on the PHQ-9 that's screening for suicide. So it says, in the past two weeks, have you had thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way? Any non-zero answer should really prompt you to assess more for suicide risk in that individual because anything other than zero means at least some point in the past two weeks they've been having those type of thoughts, suicidal thoughts that require further investigation. So this is the PHQ-9 questionnaire that's for adults, but I do want to point out there is also a version that's modified for teenagers and adolescents. And it also has some follow up yes or no suicide screening questions. So one of those is, and again, this is a yes or no question. Has there been a time in the past month where you've had serious thoughts about ending your life? And again, it's yes or no. And then the question after that, have you ever in your whole life tried to kill yourself or made a suicide attempt? So again, you have several questions on the PHQ-9, particularly if you're using the adolescent version, which should give you an idea if the patient that you're seeing is uh, having suicidal thoughts that need further investigation. The next one that I wanted to talk about was the ASQ or the Ask Suicide Screening Questions. Full disclosure, I have personally never used this screening tool myself, but I have seen it used in various hospital settings uh, that I've worked in. The first four questions on this uh, questionnaire are the screening questions. So that's really yes or no questions. And if all of those questions are no, you've completed your suicide screening. If any of those questions are yes, then you proceed on to question number five, which is really are you having thoughts of killing yourself right now? Yes or no? So if the patient says yes to question number five, which means they're having current suicidal ideation, then that patient really needs a stat, full safety and mental health evaluation. Um, if the person said yes to some of the first four, four questions, but no to question number five, meaning they may have had some suicidal thoughts, but nothing currently, they still need a brief safety evaluation to make sure they're OK. Uh, the safety assessment will really determine what your next step is beyond that. And I do want to point out, regardless of how the patient responds to the asked questions, everyone should be provided with at least one safety resource uh, that they can reach out to should they be in crisis. So the one that we recommend everyone know about is 988 which is the suicide and crisis lifeline that you can call, text, or chat with 24-7. Uh, so the screening instrument I wanted to spend the most time discussing today is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, or CSSRS. So the basic Columbia Suicide Severity 
uh, rating scale is on the right hand side of this slide. The, these are uh, yes or no questions that you're going to be asking your patients directly. You can see that the questions on there are color coded based on risk. So yellow towards the top, these first two questions, uh, those are really going to be considered the lower risk questions. As you progress down, uh, the orange is kind of medium or intermittent, uh, intermediate level of risk. And then the red is high risk, meaning it's an emergency situation and that person needs emergent care. Uh, so the reason I really like the Columbia is it's a screening instrument that also provides you with some recommendations on what your next step should be um, when you're treating an individual who is at risk for suicide. So if they answer yes to questions two or three, which is the, um, have you had any thoughts about killing yourself? Have you been thinking about how you might do that? Those individuals definitely need a behavioral health evaluation. If they say yes to any of the high risk questions, again, it's really considered an emergency. So depending on which setting you're in, you may need to send that individual to an emergency room or um, have them screened by someone at the local mental health authority or something like that. So at UTMB, we use the Columbia uh, that's combined with the safety protocol. So the first part of that combined instrument is really what I just shared with you, which is the Columbia uh, that we reviewed on the prior slide. So I do want to point out, depending on how your institution integrates this into your medical record, you may only have the first two questions that come up when you first open the Columbia. If the answer to question number two is no, meaning there's no current suicidal thoughts, it may not prompt you to do the other questions. You may not immediately see questions three, four, or five. Um, this person, if it's someone not having current suicidal thoughts, is generally considered low risk. So at our institution, if they say yes on question number two, meaning they're having current suicidal thoughts, then usually it prompts you to continue further and complete questions three through five, as well as the safe T protocol, which we're gonna go over after this. So as I mentioned, we use the Columbia that's combined with the safety protocol. So if the person is considered moderate or high risk, um, we are required to complete the safety assessment, which really further evaluates risk factors, protective factors, and gathers more specific information about the intensity of the suicidal thoughts the patient is having. So this is the first section of the safety assessment, which really focuses on the risk factors for suicide. So many of these are the same risk factors that Caroline spoke to you all about earlier in the presentation. And again, I point out the bottom access to lethal means. That's something that you're gonna definitely be asking the patients about. The second section of the safety assessment really focuses on protective factors. Again, these are some of the same protective factors that Caroline covered earlier in the presentation. I did wanna point out there's a space for you to add protective factors that you may discuss with the patient that don't show up on the list. So feel free to add to that if needed. Um, someone may have individual protective factors that really apply to them that aren't necessarily protective factors for most of the other population. And then the final portion of the safety assessment really focuses on specific questions about the person's suicidal ideation. So I know the type on this slide is pretty small, but I did want you to see exactly how it would look if you completed this assessment yourself. So you're gonna be going through these questions and uh, asking the patient these questions directly and providing them with the answer choices. And the higher scores on these questions generally indicates higher severity suicidal ideation. So the questions that you're gonna be going through, how often are you having the suicidal thoughts? How long did the thoughts last? And when you do have them, um, how well are you able to control these thoughts about suicide? Are there things in your life that have helped you or stopped you from ending your life? And then what are your reasons for wanting to die? Why is this an option for you. 
So the level of risk on the Columbia really helps you decide what the next step is in your care plan. So as I mentioned earlier, high risk individuals really need an emergent psychiatric evaluation. Um, moderate risk individuals, they may need an urgent evaluation or they may be appropriate for an outpatient referral. You have to really take into account your full risk assessment uh, when you're making that decision. And then again, low risk individuals are really appropriate for outpatient referral for a behavioral health evaluation. Something else I like about the safety protocol is there's a section at the end that really reminds you what you need to doc document in your clinical documentation. So thorough documentation is really what helps to minimize your personal liability should your patient die by suicide. You wanna make sure you're documenting everything as appropriately as you can. So one of the items recommended is implementing a safety plan. So that's what we're gonna talk about over the next couple of slides. So what is a safety plan? So you've identified this patient that's at risk of suicide and you need to put a safety plan into place. So a safety plan, it's really a list of coping strategies and sources of support that a person can use before or during a suicidal crisis. Uh, I do wanna point out that the plan should really be brief, written in the patient's own words, and it should be easy to read. Um, I also want to point out that a safety plan is a collaborative effort between the patient and the clinician. So this is not something you do for the patient. This is something you do with the patient. And then again, part of every safety plan should really include asking about access to lethal means such as firearms. I did include a link uh, for a website if you wanted to have it kind of walk you through step by step how to develop a safety plan but we're also gonna go through that in the next few slides. So this is what a safety plan looks like. Generally, it should fit on a single page. I know the type is small on this particular slide, but we're gonna go through each of those sections in subsequent, subsequent slides. <clears throat> so section number one is really about identifying warning signs that a suicide crisis might be developing i.e. what are some of the patient's triggers, helping them to kind of identify that ahead of time so they know when they start to feel that way that they might need to access their safety plan and um, remind themselves of how to keep themselves safe. So that's kind of section number one of the safety plan. Section number two is really identifying internal coping strategies. So what can the patient do to help manage their suicidal thoughts? This might be focusing on ways that they can distract themselves. You might talk about things like exercising, listening to music. Again, you're engaging the patient and helping you to figure out what is a good way to distract themselves from suicidal thoughts. Section number three on the safety plan. This is where you're identifying people that you can call. And this is really people that you're gonna to call to help distract you from the way that you're feeling. You may not necessarily be calling these individuals to say, hey, I'm feeling suicidal and I need some help. This may be just reaching out to these individuals as a way to distract yourself from the way that you're feeling. Moving past that, section number four, this is really when you're identifying friends and family members, people that you want to be able to call for help. So if your patient gets to this point in their safety plan, they're really, letting, they're really letting other people know that they're in crisis and they need some support. Uh, and then section number five, this is identifying professionals who can help. So this would include information also about like the National Suicide Hotline, 988. Basically, how can your patient get urgent help from a professional if that's something that they need? And then step number six on the safety plan is really about making sure the environment is as safe as possible. So some of the things you might be discussing at this point are removing firearms from the home, removing sharps, limiting access to medications, depending on the age of the individual, talking about whether or not they should have access to their keys or something like that. Um, so again, making sure the environment is safe and kind of figuring out things that that person may need to do in their own environment to make sure it's a safe place for them and minimizes 
their individual suicide risk. Again, this is what the document will look like, and you're going to complete this along with the patient. Um, I do want to point out if you develop a safety plan with an individual, I encourage you to revisit it periodically with the patient and update it as appropriate. So this is not a one time thing. I did my safety plan with the patient, therefore I never do it again. This is a living document that needs to be updated regularly because some of the things on this may change. So a quick reminder before we wrap up, uh, as Caroline mentioned earlier, being physicians really puts us in a group that's high risk for suicide. So as many as 300 physicians die by suicide every year. And the suicide rate amongst female physicians is much higher than the general population. So why are we at more risk? Well, these are just a few of the physician specific risk factors. We know a lot about lethal means. Uh, we have a lot of stress, both per professional and personal stress. We live very busy lives. We have difficulty with work-life balance. Some of us may suffer from burnout. Substance abuse rates are higher amongst physicians than they are the general population. And we all go through training that really kind of focuses on this idea that we put patients first, even if it means kind of sacrificing our own mental or physical health. And we're also more likely as physicians to avoid asking for help when we do need it. Some of the other barriers that keep physicians from getting help, um, physicians surprisingly struggle to identify depression and mental illness in themselves. Um, often that's because we're in a training environment that really normalizes living with stress and distress, and that's part of a physician's identity. There's also this kind of culture of silence where people don't talk about how they're feeling. And then because we're so busy, physicians often forego medical care. They miss opportunities for screening for depression. There may be some stigma for seeking help, even amongst psychiatrists, that's often the case. And then it's difficult for us to access care, even though most of us have insurance and the financial means to access care. We work a lot of hours, it's hard to take off. Taking off requires a lot of planning and follow up visits for mental health visits can take up a lot of time. And then also you can imagine physicians are concerned about confidentiality and, and concerned that other people might know that they're dealing with something or know that they're struggling. So I want to remind each and every one of you, it's important to prioritize your own mental health. Your life literally depends on it. I think by this point, everyone's pretty much aware that we have a new national suicide and crisis lifeline. Uh, it's available 24 seven via calling, texting or chat. Um, and the number for that is 988. I usually have all of my patients program this phone number into their phone while we're in the session together. So that's a routine part of my visits when I'm seeing teenagers and adolescents. Also wanted to point out that there's a very helpful resource that I came across uh, online when I was putting together this presentation, and it really helps you to kind of step by step develop your own suicide prevention plan for a clinic. So if that's something that you're looking to do is kind of set up a suicide prevention plan for your clinic, this may be a good resource to access. All right, it looks like we have plenty of time for questions. So I'll just go to this slide and let you know there are resources for these things that I talked about today. But then I also want to stop screen sharing so we have an opportunity for questions. Thank you, Dr. Shotwell. Thank you. Uh, and Caroline, this was a wonderful session and such good information. I did put a, a brief little comment in the chat here that your local CPAN team can also assist with developing a crisis protocol for your clinic. Contact your, uh, your local CPAN team here in Texas and uh, speak with them and they can get something set up for you. Um, at this time, folks that are on the uh, on the video can either ask their question in the chat 
or unmute themselves and ask the question for Dr. Shotwell or Caroline to see what they would uh, provide for you as far as information. We have uh, 47 folks on our meeting here today on this educational session. And I'm sure that there are folks out there of, um, that are at clinics um, and specializing in, in many areas that may have questions. So I'm gonna pause for a second and have folks unmute themselves. Uh, thank you, uh, Laura. I just want to congratulate uh, Caroline for a great presentation. Always good to see our medical student uh, do such a good job. I thank you, Dr. Shotwell, for your mentoring. Uh, you know, uh, uh, great talk, really. I, obviously, suicide is something uh, we all worried about, one of the deaths of despair we talk about now. Um, uh, it's interesting that you said the rate, the national rate fell between 2018 and uh, 2020, if I remember rightly. Uh, do we know why? Because that would be something interesting if we know why the, the rate fell. Maybe we have to go back to what we we're doing. Uh, do we know why it fell during that period? I personally do not know. I did look into that a little bit and I didn't see anything definitive for that. Um, Obviously, that was a very busy time for most of us. A lot of that overlap with COVID. And so you would think it would be the other direction, right? You would yeah. think the isolation and being apart from your support systems, kids not being in school, not having access to care, you know, things like that would increase the rate during that time period. The only thing I can think of is that, you know, everybody was just so busy battling the the COVID crisis and everything that came along with that, that that served as a distraction. Remember a lot of the, the ways that you can kind of prevent suicide is really helping patients to identify ways to distract themselves when they're in that period of distress. You know, find something else to focus your attention on and what takes more attention than a pandemic? You know, it was such a huge distraction. So that's my personal thought on it, but I don't know if there's been anything in particular that they've identified specifically that led to that decrease. And it was a very brief decrease, just a couple of years, and then we yeah. went back up since then. And I do think they should be pretty quickly releasing the 2023 data. I did look up um, this morning just to see if there was anything new. And it looks like the 2023 data should be coming up pretty soon. So. I'm curious to see if the upward trend continues or if at any point we can at least level out and hopefully start making some progress on that. Thank you, both of you. Definitely. So Laura, something I wanted to follow up on, something else that would be a great use of CPAN is so sometimes there's individuals that fall into that moderate risk category. When someone does the Columbia assessment, and they're not low risk, so they're not appropriate to just say, go follow up and get a mental health evaluation. They're not high risk, so they're not someone you immediately say, okay, this is someone who needs to be in a hospital setting. They need to go inpatient. They're really that moderate risk. And if you remember, I said that moderate risk, you really have to take into account the whole big picture and uh, all the risk and protective factors and clinical judgment really comes into play in that situation. So from my perspective, I don't personally do CPAN, but I could see that being an amazing thing for people to reach out and getting support from the CPAN clinicians who make these kind of decisions all the time to kind of guide them. You know, is this really someone that can be outpatient or even though they're moderate risk, do they still need to be in an inpatient setting? So level of care questions I think are great for CPAN providers. Absolutely. Um, you took the words right out of my mouth. We here in the rural areas in Northeast Texas do get calls. Uh, sometimes the question is, is this, is this urgent and emergent or is this not? And that's a fair question to ask because uh, as you spoke about in your session here, being able to assess that and assess it well um, is an important aspect of as, uh, of uh, working with those those youth, um, children, adolescents, young adults that we help to support. So yes, um, what we encourage are those providers to give us a call. 
Um, we are not uh, an, an emergent line, obviously, but if there is a question of, is this an in, inpatient? Is this an intensive outpatient situation? Um, we are here, we have specialists on the, the, the line that answer those calls and can support you with that. Thank you so much for that shout out. And also for those who work um, with women during their pregnancy or even that first year postpartum, understanding that peripan, which is now part of what we are supporting as well, that perinatal woman all the way up through one year postpartum, those same questions can come to that same phone number. So would love to have some questions from the folks on our line here. So my main goal for today was really to make sure people felt comfortable using those suicide assessments and also that they felt really comfortable putting together a safety plan. So if there are any questions specifically about that, I would be happy to answer that, but also any other questions as well. And I apologize, I keep moving around, but for some reason the sunlight has found me exactly where I'm sitting. There we go. Um, all good. You know, um, one of the things that, that I was hearing, um, and I suspect there may be some providers on this call that he have heard this as well, is putting together a suicide con a contract as opposed to what you're talking about dr shotwell and my understanding is is those contracts really don't don't hold a whole lot of water can you talk a yeah, little bit about uh, that yeah we've really moved away from that i think that's something from days past and it really was kind of meant to be protective in some ways for the clinician like okay i really made sure that the patient has agreed they're not going to do anything so if nothing else they're going to reach out to me and, and let me know and we really have moved away from that and I think the idea behind the safety plan like I mentioned it's a living breathing document so it's getting updated all the time it's the most recent who's in your friends group right you don't want to put people on your suicide safety plan that you're not interacting with anymore and you may move to a different area and you need to update your resources mm -hmm. So it's really meant to be kind of a living document that gets revisited over time. You know, and it doesn't do a lot of good to put the document together if the patient doesn't use it. So that's the other part of it is really reminding them this is meant to prevent you from going into a crisis, but it's also meant to be a resource should you get into a crisis that you have that resource to kind of help you get yourself out of that situation. So that's kind of the direction we've moved in terms of that. I don't know anyone that's routinely contracting for safety. That used to be a very common thing that was in the note, but not anymore. Right. I'm gonna wait just a little bit here. Let somebody go ahead and unmute themselves if they'd like to ask a question, either about this topic, um, CPAN or PERIPAN as well. If not, I will have another question for you. I also have something that I can point out that I think makes people hesitate to use these suicide screening instruments and do safety plans. And that's the reality that we're all very busy and we're seeing a lot of patients in clinic. And you can imagine, I mean, we spent an hour talking about this just now. So if you were going through and doing a safety assessment and talking about risk factors, talking about protective factors, it takes time. So what generally has to happen in these situations is your visit really becomes a visit assessing safety and planning for safety. It's okay for someone to come in and the reason they're coming in is a follow-up visit for ADHD and you really have to change the visit and say, okay, there are more pressing issues going on here. This is really a safety issue. I'm happy to discuss ADHD with you, but that's gonna have to happen at another visit. Today's visit is really gonna have to be focused on safety, making sure we're on the same page, making sure that we're meeting your needs and keeping you safe. So I just wanna remind people it's okay. We have permission to do that. I know sometimes we wanna to try to fit everything in and we don't wanna leave people feeling disappointed if they don't get what they're coming in for, but 
we're the experts, we're the clinicians, we know safety has to take priority. So if you need to change your visit and make it all about safety assessment, then that's what you do. I think that's such a crucial point because the, the thing that I was going to actually talk about and, and ask you about is um, I've heard from providers over the last few years as I've been going out to clinics and, and talking with them that a, I don't have time to do that because they are pressed for time. There's such a limited window available. But what happens when they say yes? And you know, you addressed some of that also in your session here. But it's it's the reality of okay, I've got somebody who in the last two weeks has been thinking about killing themselves. Um, now all of a sudden my visit has turned from a from a 15 minute visit into I don't know what it's going to be a visit. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's that can be difficult for providers as well. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think the other part of that that we all have to acknowledge is even if we identify someone as high risk for suicide and we send them to an emergency room with the plan of them being hospitalized in an inpatient setting, that may not happen for whatever reason, right? The reality is most people that end up going to the emergency room in a suicidal crisis don't get hospitalized because there's often not beds for them to be hospitalized in. This happens all the time. This happened with one of my patients about a week ago. The patient went in the day before their clinic appointment to the emergency room, suicidal, and they were discharged home to follow up with the uh, outpatient psychiatry. Still saw us the next day. Guess what? They were still suicidal and they still needed to go to the hospital. So then we had to spend a significant amount of time in the clinic visit, calling all the psychiatric hospitals, trying to find a bed, trying to arrange transportation. The nearest hospital for us, you know, we're in Galveston, the nearest inpatient child psychiatry unit to really in Houston. So we're talking an hour, hour and a half to get to the nearest inpatient units, assuming they have a bed. So yeah, I think that could be its own separate talk because it's such an involved process and such a big issue, but that is definitely the reality. It is, you know, and we see that a lot here in Northeast Texas as well. Um, in fact, we have told our providers here, if you have a patient who needs to go inpatient, give us a call. Let us make some phone calls. We, we have a list of inpatient locations. Let's see who has beds. We can't guarantee that that patient will go inpatient, but we can tell you who has beds available. And so um, because it is so difficult and time consuming for those clinics to make those calls. Um, and then there was an ask to go back a couple of slides. Um, the, the quote. Um, oh, the quote from mine that I had towards the end? Yes, please. Let's see. Let me see if I can get back to it. Okay, great. I was going to try to pull it up, but I think you've got it probably closer to you right now. I know it always takes a second to load, so just let that's me know. That's just fine, it. right there. Yeah, I think that's what you're looking for, Lisa. That's right. And this was really meant to be a reminder for clinicians, but I think we also need to remind our patients and our patients families of this as well. You know, sometimes you just need to take a little bit of time to work on your mental health and that's okay. Sometimes people just need to have permission to do so. And it's not a selfish thing to do. And I think that sometimes, especially when you have uh, professionals where we're taught to go 90 miles an hour and sometimes we feel a bit guilty for taking care of ourselves and we can't take care of our patients if we're, if we're not healthy ourselves either, Dr. Shotwell. Very so we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, what else? Um, any other questions? I'm going to drop my email in the chat in case people have questions and maybe they're just not in a great place to be able to ask them because I know it's lunchtime and people are probably eating their lunch. But if you have specific questions or need help with something, feel free to reach out. Thank you. And I'm going to pull up the uh, CMEs for 2024. 
Um, we uh, have been working, Krista from UTMB and I have been working to get these sessions uh, scheduled. I'm going to bring up this uh, on the screen here. Even though I use it all the time, it does take me a minute to pull it up. All right. Um, I'm just going to do that, leave it that way. And you'll see that we have sessions coming up starting again in January. You will also notice there are sessions in relation to the topic of perinatal now. Um, all of the hubs across the state are now serving not providers not just for patients zero through age 22, but also those moms who are uh, actively trying to be pregnant, uh, those that are pregnant, and those within one year postpartum. So you're going to see perinatal um, in some of these sessions. We have two in January, uh, introduction to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, as well as managing temper tantrums and explosive anger. So that's what we have coming up in January. We hope that you will join us for those sessions. Um, if you want more information about that, please do uh, reach out. We also have uh, CPAN Echo starting again in March. Uh, each of the hubs will have their sessions on different days. Ours here in Tyler are on Fridays, and we are partnering with U uh, UT Southwestern for that. So Dr. Shotwell and Caroline, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate your expertise and your passion in this area. And um, we look forward to uh, having you uh, again in 2024 to, to provide us an additional education. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate sure. it. Sure. Thank you very much. Y'all, everybody have a great day. And this will be loaded on our CPAN site, um, at, hopefully by the end of the day, as long as technology allows. And you'll be able to revisit it again. Thanks, all.